I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Marketing BPO, Opportunities and Techniques for Increasing Efficiency in the Marketing Supply Chain. My name is Arlene Itori, and I'm a webinar coordinator for the Outsourcing Institute, and it is our pleasure to be the co-host of today's event with Williams Lee. I'll be working in the background to help answer any technical or general questions that you may have. But before we begin, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few tools that you'll be able to use throughout today's session. First, we encourage you at any time during the presentation to submit your questions to today's speakers. To do this, click on the questions box, type your question in the space provided, and click on the submit button. During today's presentation, we'll be asking poll questions to get to know you better and to help ensure that the content is relevant to your specific needs. When the poll appears, be sure to select the answer that best fits each question. Today's webinar is being recorded. You will be receiving a follow-up email in approximately two days, which will include a link with today's recorded webinar and presentation slides. The webinar recording and the presentation slides will also be available at Outsourcing.com. Before we commence today's session, I'd like to say a few brief words about the Outsourcing Institute in case you are not familiar with us. The Outsourcing Institute is a professional association dedicated to providing independent best practices, tools, roadshow events, and networking opportunities for all forms of outsourcing. Located at Outsourcing.com, we have 70,000 members globally. I'd like to mention we have an upcoming roadshow event in New York City on June 28th, focusing on the new outsourcing global delivery model. For more details, you can visit outsourcing.com. OI specializes in providing low-cost and no-cost alternatives for outsourcing buyers in need of RFP tools, vendor selection assistance, training, as well as general support and coaching. For those of you who market into this space, we offer an array of very targeted sponsorship and promotional opportunities. Our sister company, CMS, provides recruiting services for those seeking to hire outsourced professionals experienced at buying, selling, managing, or consulting in this arena. Our contact information is on the bottom of the screen for those of you who have any questions. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. We have Frank Olivieri. Frank is President and Chief Operating Officer of Marketing Solutions for Williams Lee. Also with us is Matt Swain, Associate Director of Document Outsourcing for InfoTrends. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Matt. Well, thank you, Arlene, and thanks for having me. So, uh, what I'd like to start with is, is a quick overview of today's agenda, and then we're going to dive right into a poll question to, to better understand who we have on the phone here. Um, so, so, if we look at today's agenda, I'm going to open with an introduction to marketing business process outsourcing and talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to turn it over to Frank, who's going to talk about Williams Lee. And, and some of their client success stories. And, and those are always very valuable um, for anybody that is considering outsourcing but hasn't yet taken that plunge. To, to be able to see someone else who has been successful at it makes it that much easier to, to go in that direction. I will pick up after Frank with, with one slide of conclusions and recommendations. And then we'll open up to, to an open question and answer uh, forum at the end. Now, I'm happy to field questions as we go. I'm going to act as moderator today. So if you have questions coming in, I will, I will take them as we go. And, uh, and then those that, that we need to hold until the end, we'll, we'll certainly have plenty of time at the end to, to talk through your questions. So with that, Arlene, why don't we start with the first poll question? So our first poll question here is, what are the functions within your business that are outsourced today? Um, and you see that you can select one option here. So we're looking for what, what do you outsource um, more so than anything else today? And, and in about a minute here, we'll be able to, uh, to, to show you the response from, from the audience. Now, just for background on InfoTrends, um, we are a market research and consulting firm. Uh, I run the document outsourcing business. We, we work with, with document-centric outsourcing providers that, that provide um, print services, 
um, that provide creative services and logistic services. And then we also work with enterprises looking to outsource um, to various, various providers. Um, so we are about 75 to 100 employees based, uh, headquartered in Boston and offices in, outside of London, Tokyo, and Tel Aviv. So it looks like we have the responses here, and, and Frank, this, this will give us some insight into who we have um, on the line. So it looks like 41% uh, are not outsourcing anything today or, or anything that was on the list. Um, so we have a lot of people looking at outsourcing opportunities. 35% um, are doing some form of IT outsourcing, some doing finance, accounting, and procurement outsourcing. Um, but look at that, no, nobody doing marketing outsourcing on the line today or HR um, or administrative support. So uh, we're really looking forward to having a discussion with you today and, and hopefully we, we uh, make some outsourcers out of you. Um, so, so Arlene, here's, here's the slide on InfoTrends. I talked a little bit about our background, but why don't we dive right into the next slide. So as a marketer, um, or as a business in general, there is intense competition for customers. This, is, this has always been the case. I think it's more so the case now with um, proliferation of, of electronic media and also um, the, the expanding or globalization of customers in general and, and, and providers. So if you look at how your business is expanding, um, not only are you looking at customers within one region or, or growing business within a region, but you're really looking globally. And what happens when you start to look globally is, um, is, is you, you, it, you run into new problems. You run into sourcing problems. You, you have to work with different vendors who might not have worked in those regions before. Um, so as a, as a marketer, now you have competition for customers. You're, you're, forced to go global, but at the same time, there's pressure to do more with less. So you're sitting there saying, you've stripped down my, my resources, um, you're telling me that we need to grow the business, um, and you're telling me that, that I need to do that with the same budget if I'm lucky, but probably a, a tighter marketing budget than I had in the past. And this this is, a, this is an area of frustration for a lot of companies, and you might be sitting on the line thinking that you know, this, this aligns with what you're seeing. Um, so, so you think about the expanding communications channels, for instance. Um, on the next slide, what we look at is, luckily for you, direct mail still yields the highest return on investment. So let's start right with that from a marketing perspective. Historically, you might have done the spray and pray marketing or Dumbo drops. Um, the, the mailbox was full of clutter. Um, what we're seeing in, in, from our research is that you start to have businesses um, become smarter about the data, so understand, better understanding how to target their customers. But also with so many businesses moving away from direct mail, you have a less cluttered mailbox. Um, so just for, for quick reference here, our research is showing that direct mail is still a very powerful tool. But it's not the only tool. If we look at the next slide with, um, with all of the different media channels that you're trying to cover, it's really important to have consistent messaging in that multi-channel world. So um, if you have a mobile marketing manager, are they talking to the person who's in charge of their direct mail and print campaign? Um, it, it's very important to have a centralized strategy around communication as you're competing for customers, as you're going more global, and with that pressure to do more with less. And I think what you'll find from today's discussion is um, it sometimes is easier to go outside the organization to a single source provider that can help you manage that whole communications life cycle. Um, and on the next slide, what we, what we found from one of our studies is that when you integrate that direct mail piece, that print piece, with other channels, so if you have a, a multi-channel campaign that includes a web landing page, we found a 19% lift in return on investment just by integrating those two campaigns. When you go as far as adding print, a web landing page, email, and mobile marketing, 
all within the same, same campaign, we found a 34% increased return on investment. So that doing more with less um, concept really comes back to how do I make sure that the channels I'm using are optimized to best reach that customer. So let's talk a little bit about marketing business process outsourcing. Um, think about marketing business process outsourcing as contracting that entire repeatable marketing business process to an outside provider, a third party provider. Now, what you're looking at here is that entire life cycle, um, maybe overly simplified for some of your life cycles, but that entire life cycle of, of, of the marketing uh, value chain. So I'm going to start with analyzing the data that I have on, on my customer or on a consumer. Then I'm going to strategize, design, produce, distribute, interact. Um, interact with that customer, track responses, analyze the data, and go out with a new campaign. Now there are portions of this process um, that have processes within them that, that really would benefit from outsourcing. So if you look at, um, for instance, you might look at the design line and say, you know, we're not ready to outsource the design component of our, of our um, marketing strategy. But you know what, where we really need help is production and distribution. And what I did with the next slide here is I gave a, a kind of a high level view at what that production and distribution value chain looks like. Um, think about a siloed organization where each person has their preferred vendor. One guy I play golf with, so I use him as a printer for my wide format paper or my wide format initiatives. But uh, a business line manager for another unit uses a completely different guy. And what happens is very quickly, whether it's on the creative side, the, the direct mail side, um, the banner or point of purchase or promotional product, uh, you, you get into a pretty wide web of vendors that you're working through. And, and this is where the outsourcing value really comes in. And Frank's going to talk a little bit about this with his, with his customer success stories. But think about going to a single provider that can interact with the various businesses and get you um, volume-based pricing and optimize that, that, that value chain, but also control your brand. Um, Frank has plenty of stories about going into a boardroom with brochures from 15 different locations and showing 15 different brochures for a company that probably was looking to standardize colors, standardize look and feel across the organization, but that hasn't happened because they're using different providers in different regions. Um, this, this is an area that a lot of companies don't really think, sit down and think about too often, but that's why we're on the call today to really dive into this and help you understand that the brand component of this that's even, that might be even more important than the cost savings component that's, that's tied to this. As we move to the distribution arm, I might be distributing letters, I might be distributing point of purchase items to stores or branches, um, I might be distributing parcels, then we go to electronics, so I'm just, uh, it's an email distribution or mobile or to various websites or through social media. And again, I'm trying to maintain brand control, I'm trying to, make, to keep up with all of the um, all of the technology and the various channels that I need to distribute to and communicate through. And for most businesses, it becomes cost prohibitive to do so well um, very quickly. Now, the, the benefit of an outsourcing provider is this is their core competency. Their job is to make sure that they're the best at, at uh, production and distribution for you. If you move further upstream, Williams Lee is a great example of a company that's really good on the creation and design as well. Uh, and, and I had a chance to tour their facilities a few months ago, and it's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so, so depending on which part of the value chain you're looking for support in, whether it's the whole process or a portion of it, uh, going to a single source outsourcing provider can be very valuable to you. So on the next slide, we talk about if you do this in-house, in well, you're going to have to add resources because everyone stretched stretched incredibly thin right now, so think about you having to take on another 10% of work, you just you couldn't do it. 
Um, and also there's a lot of investment, investment in technology, um, investment in time and, and understanding the various, um, the, the landscape of production distribution, centralizing that, that really speaks to the benefit of outsourcing. So the next slide here, outsourcing is a game changer. Um, I'm not saying this just because I run a service, that a consulting service and a market research service around outsourcing, but you, it really does change the, the, um, the value to your organization. It, it, your accounts payable department is going to love you because now they're on, down to a single invoice instead of you know, a couple hundred invoices. Um, and, and you're going to love it because there's brand control. So we looked at four, four top points here. Outsourcing is a game changer. It's significant and sustainable cost saving, greater efficiency through process re-engineering, greater visibility into where and how marketing dollars are spent through tracking, um, and, and there's brand consistency across functional areas, geographies, and media. And, and Frank's going to, I think the biggest part of, uh, the biggest value in what Frank's going to talk about shortly is, is that visibility. Um, because he, I think that you look at the supply chain, and if you can have visibility into what's being spent and where, very quickly, uh, you, you will find a, a cost savings opportunity, but also have that brand control. So with that, as, a, as an opener, what I'd like to do is ask a second poll question. So the second poll question here is, have you considered outsourcing areas of the marketing supply chain? And, and if so, which one? Is it print management? Is it creative? Is it logistics? Um, or, or none of the above. So, so which one are you most likely to look to outsource? And while we're waiting for the response there, I'd like to, um, to, to start the introduction for Frank. So Frank Olivieri is the President and, and Chief Operating Officer of Williams Lee uh, America's marketing solutions business. If you're not familiar with, with Williams Lee, the marketing solutions business is a service provider for Fortune 500 firms and a global leader in marketing supply, supply chain and procurement outsourcing. So Olivieri uh, is the leader in marketing solution, uh, is the leader of the marketing solutions business in the Americas, um, which includes leading the startup and the growth to where the business is today with approximately 300 employees and $800 million in spend under management. So let's go back to the response here from the quick poll. So it looks like we have 41% of respondents are saying, okay, so we're not looking to outsource any of, of the ones listed, but, but potentially outsourcing, um, considering outsourcing other functions. 35% say print management, and then there's 12% there's for creative and logistics. So with that, Frank, why don't we turn it over to you to talk a little bit about Williams Lee, talk about these client success stories, and, I'll, and I've received a few questions here, but feel free to keep sending questions over, and I'll make sure that we get those answered by the end of the, the session today. Frank? Matt, thank you for that. Um, certainly thank you for your, for your work at InfoTrends, and certainly thank you uh, to the Outsourcing Institute for their support. Um, what I'd like to do is set the stage and give you a sense of what some of our clients in the market is, are telling us about. Um, the current market environment impacting their organizations and how those factors are reverberating throughout their infrastructure and impacting the way they look at their marketing communications and supply chain. Um, I also want to give you a high-level description of the benefits of outsourcing, and we're going to spend a few minutes on the word outsourcing, how companies can partner with an outsourcer to optimize the marketing supply chain. Um, certainly going to tell you how companies are using strategic sourcing and vendor management to gain significant sustainable cost reductions. Um, faster time to market from concept to delivery, improve their brand consistency and financial transparency into how their marketing dollars are spent. And then I'm going to wrap up with some, as Matt said, real world examples of outsourcing in action. Um, so you can see how business process outsourcing is helping industry leaders, uh, specifically to one retailer, specifically to one uh, financial services business in the top three in its, in its ranking, um, and then reduce cost improve efficiency, and stay one step, step ahead of the competition. Um, but before we do that, we want to spend a few minutes just talking about Williams Lee 
Um, we're a business that that uh, is built on its delivery and execution. Um, we're a global business process outsourcing company. Uh, we have a consultative approach to analyzing, re-engineering, and managing business processes and solutions for these. And I think that's an important point. We uh, we what gets outsourced to Williams Lee are business processes, and with that um, can be the people, the technology, um, and some service level guarantees, if you will, in place. And we run that more efficiently and more effectively uh, than a client would, and that's the first step in determining um, whether to engage a BPO company or not. We have a 192-year heritage. We've been uh, an organization since 1820. We're a two-plus billion dollar business, and um, we're princip our principal investor is a $70 billion um, dollar, uh, Deutsche Post DHL entity. Uh, we have a global footprint with 900 plus sites in 39 countries, approximately 10,500 employees worldwide, and just under 4,000 in the Americas. And I think it's important to note that um, whether you take the Americas number or the global number, 80% of those people came from our clients. And I think that's a that's a very very important point that we'll come on and talk about later. That's uh, can be an attraction to, uh, to outsourcing a business process. Uh, we have unique experience in building customized right shore solutions for our clients. Uh, we're an industry focused delivery organization with significant experience in the retail, CPG, financial services, publishing, direct response spaces. And um, we're partnered in many of the world's most demanding and leading organizations. So, so broad, broad strokes of what Williams Lee does and a bit about the company that, uh, that I work for. So I'm, I'm uh, fortunate enough to run uh, the business, uh, the marketing supply chain outsourcing business, which is really what we're talking about today. Um, and I think we're going to come on and talk about how we how we look at that space. But um, within the marketing supply chain solutions, that includes commercial print and fulfillment, point of sale and point of purchase, packaging, circular print, pre-press, paper logistics, and quite honestly, several other several other item, items that are not on uh, not listed on the slide. And additionally, global creative services, we, uh, we run 59 studios, 1,200 design staff. We have onshore and offshore facilities, and um, the ability to own campaign design and execution through fulfillment and delivery. And I think all of this means, um, you'll see on the next slide, all of this means there's an untapped um, area of spend that sometimes can get captured underneath various categories in a company's GL. Um, many of the engagements we, uh, we start with is a consultative front-end approach. I mean, we're brought in to organize um, the, the, this company's spend in a particular area we're talking about. And through this, we've seen some interesting things such as, you know, print spend or marketing spend, if you will, categorized under black car service and dry cleaning and whatnot, if you can imagine that. I think what part of our first job is to gain control and visibility into where these marketing dollars are going. If you look at the, the slide um, as, as, we are, as we are at this moment, the marketing supply chain consists the way we see it as creative design, which is not a core competency of Williams Lee and is something that uh, most of our clients enjoy working with design agencies on. But there is a line just past that which we strategically see as execution. Mm -hmm. And you know, in the first box is adaptation and production design, moving into creative production, which includes resizing, layout changes, uh, imaging, text amendments, um, getting something ready to go to whatever the media channel is that it's going to. In particular, the next box is the print media channel. Um, where you're, you're pre-media and digital, um, prepare, digitally preparing files for press and, in some case, the web. Uh, this, cons this consists of procuring the print, the paper, the postage, the fulfillment, and again, the pre-media and the digital aspect of it. And then there's um, something often forgotten at the back end called logistics and, uh, and distribution, which can sometimes include kitting, warehousing, and destination management. And that Adaptation to logistics is what we see as the total marketing supply chain, 
um, and we believe is our business is set up to execute within a, a, a realm of a business process that is defined as we've laid it out here. Now, the more I could tell you this, the market today, uh, in many of the engagements we start, um, don't look for the lights to go on on all four, adaptation and production design, creative production, print management, logistics at one time. Um, we started this business um, about 10 years ago, specifically in the print management space. Many of our contracts have matured since then, and we're bleeding out into the creative production space and certainly downstream into the logistics space because of their need. I'd also tell you that um, the business model in, in whatever the, the client um, is looking for is paramount that it has a goal and a strategy and objective to achieve that um, we often call this model the end savings model. Certainly this model can deliver savings full stop but I think it's additional to that other value-added areas such as speed to market. So we're going to talk about a financial institution which, which, with which we took a process from six weeks to four weeks. And the implications to that institution was increased revenue generation. So they took marketing dollars and that we freed up by doing this more efficiently and reinvesting it back in we compress the time frame down so they can get to more customers and increase their acquisition rate. Huge, huge revenue um, value to them uh, along with the savings delivery. That we're, we're also going to talk about other clients who, um, in, in the case of you know, the, the investment banking industry, who have regulatory requirements that because much of the spend was spread out um, very decentralized, we were able to take control and ensure they weren't experiencing any regulatory, um, uh, out of compliance with any regulatory rules or, or regulations, um, and deliver savings to them as well. So it's more of a risk mitigation play. So, so when we define the end-to-end -end marketing supply chain, that's really how we see it. And you know, I'd, I'd say on top of all that, it's print management, but it also is, as Matt said, social media. It's electronic, so the best way to save money on print, we often say, is to eliminate it. So the good news is you've got a, a business model that can also control the spend, gather it together, can give transparency into where it goes, can drive the efficiency out of the, it, down to the model, and uh, free up dollars that can be reinvested in, back into the business and repurposed into other areas of, of, um, of media, multi-channel, print, digital, et cetera. Hey, Frank, one, one question that I had come through here is around, uh, you, do you only provide a solution where you, where you own that whole process, or, or do you provide solutions where you could pick point, point components of that BPO? Process? Yeah, I think it's the latter, Matt. In, in all cases, it's, it's, our experience has been the latter. Um, as I said, you, it, very few clients want to flip the light switch on because it's quite a the, the inertia of that change internally can be significant. Um, much of the, uh, the the engagements we have started with print management and have evolved up, but with the recent acquisition of TAG in uh, Q3 of, two, of 2011, we've been selling a lot more of the front end creative production solutions and migrating down to print. So there's definitely a balance. I, I haven't seen one to put a light switch on to all at one time yet. Thank you. So if we can flip to the next slide and just speak a, a little bit about um, some specific examples that we have, uh, we've seen and experienced in the past. And the first one is really um, specific to, a, to a, a global retail giant. It operates under multiple brand names across many different countries, sells a broad range of products across core categories. Um, you'd know them all, grocery, apparel, toys, et cetera. Um, they're headquartered in the U.S., and their store footprint is way, well greater than 2,000, uh, closer, more closer to 4,000. Um, the challenge when we first engaged this particular, uh, this particular client was really um, a, a broken business process. It was one where um, while, while a significant amount of spend um, that in the print channel, it was their most, uh, it was the second most effective way of increasing store traffic. Uh, first being television, and they didn't really have any control over it. A lot of the processes were manual, 
and it was under-resourced and under-invested. And I think when uh, we first engaged this particular client, we came with a, uh, with a program back to them where we disaggregated the process and re-aggregated it, introducing different methodologies, best-in-class uh, technologies, um, and, a, and a reinvestment in people with a much more um, uh, efficient process at which time it became, um, uh, it was it enabled them in the end to produce uh, what they were doing, 24 circular events a year, to what they aspired to do was 52 a year or one a week, and that really in the end had nothing to do with um, with cost savings. It had everything to do with I got to reach my customers and increase store traffic. We actually even came up with a metric, um, which was revenue per square inch of their circular, to help them track the success of this. And then, you know, through all this, we drove out uh, significant cost savings in what was, at that time, the particular spend, which was their printed circular. So, uh, you know, the solution today um, continues to be an established, dedicated near-site team um, of marketing supply chain professionals, some of which used to work for the company. Um, that now work for Williams Lee, and I think I alluded to something at the very beginning. When you operate a business with outsourcing as part of the, the title of the business, I think that can be a scary title in, in, some, in some cases. Um, outsourcing for, for my business is not a labor arbitrage uh, model. It is actually, in all cases, we actually add more people to the model because it was under-resourced and under-invested in. So, and, and we take people, and there is a rebadging aspect to it, but these people have careers in our business. Um, we promote, um, you know, we promote roughly 20 to, to 30 people a year. Um, many of those come from, from our clients that now work for Williams Lee, and we have vice presidents and directors in the business at significant levels that um, if we're left at the, uh, at the companies they worked at prior to the outsourcing model, they would have um, they would have probably had a glass ceiling and had to change their career track. Today they've got a a, a leadership role in a professional uh, marketing supply chain business. So the net result of all that for this particular client were uh, net savings of seventy million over a four year term, gross savings roughly between twenty to thirty percent as a result of a re engineered vendor strategy and adding the right level of competitive tension back in. This particular scenario had um, very little competitive tension in their in their supply base, and um, and a 50% increase in uh, in the number of circulars generated per annum, and uh, certainly a uh, a flexible and uh, a scalable solution. Uh, they they improved their speed to market and and improved quality and consistency of their brand, which is for them of paramount importance. The ne the next uh, the next example I think is. Um, is one more specific to, uh, to the financial services sector, and this is a, a, a top three financial services organization where we, we through the same uh, uh, re uh, disaggregation of a business process and then re-aggregation um, with, again, the right technology, the appropriate technology, the right tension, uh, the right vendor supply base, uh, and the right resource um, have saved this particular uh, client over 10% of its $100 million spend in their card acquisition space. Um, this particular client um, was only able to get a certain amount of um, what, they, what they're considering one of their, their most effective way to the market, uh, which is their direct mail packs, through a business process with limited people and um, a very inefficient one, only a limited amount of those to the marketplace, where the spend went from roughly $70 million to, by the time we were uh, we were, we were finished um, re-engineering their process, and this is the client where we've taken a six-week process down to less than four weeks and have taken those dollars and went right back into the marketing, uh, the marketing budget and have reached out further into the, uh, into, the, into the U.S. and across Latin America and Canada to reach more customers, um, uptick their acquisition, and really, really improve their... Uh, their, their revenue. So this particular client would probably thank us for the cost savings so that they could reinvest it back into their business and improve their, um, their rate of return on their uh, marketing investment dollars. You know, the solution in the end was a, was a three-month consultancy, which we did at our cost uh, to understand their business environment and issues. 
Uh, we entered a seven-year partnership. Um, our solution involved building a centralized strategic production operation with account service employees deployed on site within four major divisions. Uh, a single procurement tool was implemented. Um, we, off, we also in, introduced a formal vendor management strategy. And we have now uh, recently um, bolted on the, uh, the creative production to this piece as well. So they're actually headed right down the road of uh, the full marketing supply chain uh, offering. So, so two, two examples of where this, this um, and neither one of these uh, particular examples, by the way, um, we were their first outsourcing engagement outside of IT. So when you talk about marketing supply chain outsourcing or just the, the company's culture and appetite for outsourcing, when we were able to get their heads around the business process outsourcing and the cultural uh, focus we have on our people and our uh, ability to, uh, to have referenceable clients that are confident in our delivery, I think we were able to, to uh, convince and in the end was the right decision both of these particular entities to outsource to Williams Lee. I think if we flip to the next slide, you know, we can we can summarize um, by saying in the end, um, and this is Williams Lee, but but a properly done engagement, um, an outsourcing engagement in this space, um, should yield a highly customized client-focused solution, uh, thought leadership and methodology for transformation and controlled change management, uh, and I don't want to uh, gloss over that. Much of the business that I run is all about change management inside a supply chain for a company. We've been hired to integrate uh, a, a post and acquisition. We've been hired to uh, risk mitigate. We've been hired to brand comply, uh, create dollars to reinvest. And I think all of that comes through the change management channel. Uh, full accountability of process, talent transfer and retention strategies, a broad capability set, um, and subject matter expertise. Uh, by vertical industry. There is a big difference between operating inside a financial institution and op operating inside a publishing company, both culturally and, um, and managing through the change process. Uh, once you get through that, the business process do look similar at a high level, and then as you break it down to very, very tactical levels, become very, very customized to those industry verticals. Strategic sourcing is, um, is the key. Uh, around spend aggregation and purchasing leverage for Williams Lee. Um, if you ask clients, could they save money in year one of our relationships, they'd probably tell you they could. But if you ask clients, could they get a sustainable run rate in years two through five or seven of you know double digit savings year over year in the stream, they couldn't do it without the leverage and, uh, and market expertise and, uh, and relationships that Williams Lee has. And then I don't want to gloss over in innovation because there's a continuous review of new technologies and capabilities that we go through. We often have innovation forums for our clients to show them what's best in the marketplace. And then and, and lastly, you know, it's all about results. If you, if you engage in an outsourcing, uh, in a BPO company such as Williams Lee to outsource a segment or the entire marketing supply chain, it must deliver results that are transparent and are visible and can be felt by the business line. Um, it must be seen that the efficient processes that I talked about earlier um, are streamlined and it increase internal capacity um, and certainly speed to market in many cases. Uh, it's flexible um, and it's, uh, it's pricing models and the way, uh, the way we, uh, we, we gain benefit for the client. And then um, it's got immediate and long-term cost savings that uh, over time can be uh, uh, mostly around leveraging the marketplace and creating sophisticated strategies to a, to a market with lots of overcapacity into it. So, so I think, um, you know, if you, Arlene, if you can go to the next slide real quick. I think, I, uh, Matt, I'm going to turn this back over to you and certainly be available for any questions, but I think uh, just in conclusion, I think the marketing supply chain is um, still, in many cases, um, an area of spend that people are trying to, uh, to identify where the opportunity is. It's a significant amount of spend in a company's business and a company's P&L. And I think the biggest decision is, is buying print and buying creative production core to what a business does to make 
its profitability numbers and return to its investors um, or not. And if it is not, then I think outsourcing a business process is probably something to, uh, to examine further. So, so Matt, back to you. Thanks, Frank. And maybe, Arlene, we could move back a slide for a minute here. Before we go into the, the opinion, there are some questions that I wanted to, to throw to you. Sure. Uh, one of the questions that came through was uh, asking for a little more detail around the vendor management approach. Can, can you speak to how you're, you're managing the, the various providers for the, for the enterprise? Sure. If, uh, if, if you're, um, and we're just shy of a billion dollars to spend under management, you're talking about a 30-plus person organization in my business that is organized by commodity. So paper, so letter shop, envelopes, and every one of those, those professionals are out in the marketplace vetting out the newest technology, um, new vendors, vendors that in many cases Williams Lee might invest in to try to get a, a capability in place. So it's really, these are your research analysts to a market that can be nebulous to many and can come back with a sourcing strategy that fits a particular client. Um, for example, we were able to, in one of our accounts, um, because of the engagement we had with the client and our market uh, reach inside the, uh, quite honestly, in the envelope market, we were able to standardize um, this particular client's 86 different versions of envelopes down to six, and then capacity by or futures by envelopes to a level that um, you know we're pretty sure we're, uh, we're 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 way below the market, and and when you get to that point, and that's just an example, you now have a uh, a market expert. You've found a win-win for all the the partners, and you've just made somebody else's business much more efficient. Yeah, I think that that speaks to a little bit of what I was discussing up front with um, lack of transparency. I think for that example the only reason you were able to go from 86 different envelopes to six was because you were able to lay out everything side by side that the organization was doing and recognize where, where the inefficiencies were. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, I think you hit it well when you, uh, when you did your piece. I think you know, we do this for a living. I think you're talking about when, you, when you're going to enter a retailer and you're going to talk about point of sale materials, you have to think five and six steps ahead because the people who are going to, um, if you will, deploy the point of sale materials when it finally reaches one of those whatever hundred or thousand stores for that particular retailer, it's the store manager. So you have to think innovatively as to how you're going to procure, produce, and then ship it so that when they open the box up with the materials, it just pops up into the stand and they just put it where they want the store. I think those those vendor management and sourcing people in that particular area are actually thinking of how not only how to buy it best, but how the end user is going to take it and deploy it so that the customer, their customers, can get the biggest you know wow factor when they actually see it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another question that came in was around. It looks like this person is IT centric, but um, all, companies already outsourcing. Um, business processes it looks like, but not on the marketing front. Is, and the challenge here from the way I'm interpreting this is that uh, the marketers aren't necessarily interested or don't get it. Um, how, how do you deal with that organizational alignment? Yeah, and it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a great question and it's, and it's honestly, it's the question. Um, the, the first step in this is whenever you engage in a, in a uh, change management business process outsourcing such as this model, it needs to be sponsored um, at a pretty senior level inside of an organization. Um, you, you'd almost go as far as saying it's mandated. Mm -hmm. And while that mandate might come from a, a financial office or an operations office or a procurement office, somewhere in that journey, the marketing office has to step into the fray and a seminar that looks a lot like the one we're given today with maybe some more detail specific to their business, um, has to take that particular CMO, if you will, on that journey so that they understand you're not actually going to take and mess around with their unit of competitive advantage, which would be their brand and their creative design. But you also, at the same time, have to get them to understand there are aspects of, if you were to change you know, Matt Swain's suit in the annual report from blue to green, 
you shouldn't be paying somebody in a creative agency $400 an hour to do that. There's creative production agencies and companies like Williams Lee that can do that and procure that for 40 bucks an hour. And that in and of itself is a significant savings. And by the way, is all execution has got nothing to do with the strategy of that campaign. So it is, to answer the person's question, I think it is a, uh, it is a series of meetings that depending on where these engagements start, if it starts with the marketing folks, that's great. They've already got a sniff of what this is about and it is taking them on a journey to understand the vision of this, which is beyond um, really print management or creative execution. It's the marketing supply chain view. If you're starting in one of the other offices, it's paramount that you migrate your way over to the, to the marketing person's strategic agenda so that you are 100% aligned with them um, and that this isn't against what they're doing because it will go nowhere if that's the case. And to, to expand on that from... I, I guess my question would be, who, who owns this? Because if you look at the end-to-end -end process that touches on the IT needs and the, the marketers' needs and, and otherwise, um, who, who organizationally is pulling the trigger on this or, or pulling everybody together? Yeah, so, so what, one of the trends we're seeing that is significant and very, very recent, I would say over the past you know, 12 to 18 months, is that the CPO office and the CMO are virtually joined at the hip now. I mean, one knows exactly what the other one is doing. In the, both of the case studies I spoke about today for the retailer and the financial services company, who owned that process and all the dollars in it was the CMO. Mm -hmm. Now, he or she did not know they owned a large <laughs> portion of the print piece of it, but um, that's part of the revelation of the change process and going through that. So. So I think the answer to that question is specific to a, to each company. Um, I could tell you in the publishing world, it's much more the, the COO who owns it. Um, you know, and I think it, it kind of CPG companies, it's much more the CPO, where the right. CMO is not, not far behind. Well, if you look at if you look at the um, the financial sec sector, you have a clear example of where. IT and ops has traditionally always owned the transactional documents, bill statements, EOBs, otherwise. And, uh, and then marketing owned the direct mail and point of sale and, and, and that kind of component. But really, that, those walls have, have been broken down and, and the marketers are understanding, oh, I, I have cross-sell, upsell opportunities with the transactional document. And I think that, that all feeds into the same point. If, if marketing understands that they own anything where the brand is related, the brand is hitting a consumer, then then the sell hopefully becomes a little easier. I think that's right. I think it, I think it, it then goes to the next phase, which is um, gaining control and visibility, as we discussed earlier in the in the webinar, around what that spend is and and how best to to present that to back to the business. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, I don't know that I'll get to all of these, but one other question here that, that probably is an important one is, is when, when is this type of engagement successful and when is it not? So can, and we, we saw some success stories. Are, where, where could you run into trouble trying to outsource? Yeah, um, great question. So um, look, I mean, I'll, I'll give you my, my nine years of experience you know, being one of the first businesses in this space to start up in a very, what was unsophisticated print management model that is now quite a sophisticated marketing supply chain model. The, 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 um, the real key to, to this business is to have the eye to know when to not engage with a company. Um, and when I say that, the first step is, are you at the right level? Does that person have the right remit or mandate to make a change as significant as this? Mm -hmm. Two, is that person connected to the marketing folks, as we just discussed? Three, once you get past that, um, you, 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 if, if both of those don't check out, it's probably best to start to disengage because, as you would imagine, in a business like, like mine where you're doing these, you know, everything about this talks about, you know, eight to nine months to get this up and off the ground through full consultancy to go live to gaining the benefit. I think um, the faster you get to that point where you know the client is very serious about it, has, a, has an agenda, has goals and objectives that align with yours, 
I think the last piece that I think is very, very important is if you get through all that, there's probably one final step left, which is um, in, in some cases you have scenarios mm -hmm. where uh, the companies are not as, as integrated as, as maybe others, and the, the benefit or the savings, if you will, that might derive from a model like this would be returned back to corporate and not back to the marketing group's budget. That creates commercial misalignment or lack of commercial alignment, if you will, and um, can really create some chaos in a, in a process. And, and we experienced that and had to use our executive relationships to, uh, to find a way to bridge through that. So, so uh, I'd love to tell you um, and, and uh, that uh, every one of these, from first meeting to end, is a success. But uh, sometimes a success is knowing when to disengage when a company is not ready to, to take on a change process like this. Okay, great. Um, one quick question from from a an insurance provider. So the the question was, you showed us a, a retail and a and a financial example. Do you have some other verticals that are that are central to the strategy that where you could show success stories? I do, and and. Um, I'm always leery of, uh, of, of talking about uh, industry verticals we play in and then saying financial services and then just leaving that huge umbrella out there. I, I think we um, recently last year uh, did an engagement with, an, with a large, one of the, maybe the world's largest insurance companies and we're uh, you know, just there with some of the senior folks this morning and, and uh, systemically going through their business. Um, as, as that person who asked that question would know, it's a unique culture. Um, it's a very, uh, these, these companies are generally very decentralized, very um, line specific, so gathering up the print spend in, a, in, an, in an insurer's model is the bigger challenge than actually getting the savings or delivering or executing, quite honestly, and um, we have, a, we have a, an example of that that uh, certainly we can, uh, we, can, we can share with the group in a case study. Great, thanks. Um, and, and then the uh, there, there's always the question on on, on cost and on um, and timeline of implementation. So I assume that the, the answer is going to be it depends. It depends. But can can you speak to that at all? Yeah, I think um, cost. Um, I think if you if you're engaging a pure play BPO, not a software provider, not a broker, a pure play BPO. I think the the cost or the cost of the customer, if you will, um, should be pure benefit, and the the way a company like Williams Lee should make its money is as out of a portion of the returns. So uh, a net benefit back to the client, where where whatever Williams Lee makes on those engagements should be funded or derived by the the value or the savings they get to, and I think that's pretty consistent across most. I think the timeline to implement um, is, is a very, very good question and is dependent, I would say, on two work streams. One, if the client's data is robust, then I think you can compress an implementation that normally is three months down to five weeks. Um, I haven't seen many of those. I've seen maybe one or two examples of that where the client was already ready for this and spent a year before prepping up the data and had it all re ready and robust enough. I think the second is, um, you know, is the legal work stream. Anytime you have a contract to be built between entities, it can, can elongate a bit. But I think all of that fits inside uh, a three months, but I've seen it go as fast as five weeks. Okay. And then uh, maybe one last question here that we can get to before the, the wrap-up is when you talk about outsourcing the marketing or outsourcing marketing BPO, is it really outsourcing the, the buying of the marketing or the buying of the print or, or is it more than that? Is it creative services and otherwise? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think, um, you know, th there's, a, there's a delineation happening in the marketing um, organizations within certainly the companies I've seen where they talk about marketing, which is the creative thought campaign development folks, which I would align with the creative agencies, which is not what Williams Lee does. And then I think there's marketing operations, which is 
a part of that supply chain or that role, if you will, um, which is really what Williams Lee proposes to do for those customers. And that includes the buying and procuring, the production managing, the receiving of forecasting, and the working with those creative people so that when they're talking about those campaigns, and be, well, whether it's a print media or a, a social media, they're coming up with those very different ideas around um, what substrates, in some cases, they might run on, or you know what what colors might look better. And the answer to all those recommendations from the Williams Lee folks might be no, but at least we're in there constantly adding value in in the in the in the creative aspect of it, so that we have visibility all the way downstream, and things can be procured out ahead, things can be planned ahead, and I think the process can be worked in its efficiently in the way it was designed, which is in an efficient manner. So it's marketing ops and marketing procurement, I would say, are the two aspects. The marketing, marketing, if you will, is, uh, again, not something Williams Lee, um, realize, well, something Re Williams Lee realizes it is not core to our business. Great. I think that did help. Thank you. So, Frank, thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to move on here to, to some closing thoughts. Uh, and, uh, and and thank you for thank you for giving that overview and answering those questions. No, it was a, it was a, it was my pleasure. Great, thank you. So, from our perspective, from the analyst perspective, the, the first point is to consider outsourcing. And 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 forty one percent of you said you're not outsourcing anything. Some are doing I, outsourcing IT services. Some some otherwise. Uh, but from a marketing perspective and, and outsourcing the, the procurement of, of print and, and the production end of, of the creative, I, I think that there really is a, a great opportunity to save money on what you're doing already and as Frank noted with those examples, reinvest that money to be more effective. So your budget doesn't really actually change. You get just get to be more effective because you save 10% or 26% or whatever it was on, on that um, print spend. Um, the, the second point is is look at the services portfolio. So I've been I've been tracking document outsourcing providers for a while, and again, companies that that focus on document related outsourcing, uh, and these guys are really aggressively moving upstream. Frank alluded to starting as a more of a print management company, but but I met, he mentioned the acquisition of Tag. I alluded to it. Um, when I went into the tag facility and got a got a view into what they were doing, they were doing colorizing for a commercial that I saw come come on within that week. Um, so you know, back end production house that's doing a lot more than just than than print work, but also uh, really helping to manage an entire brand's image. Um, so so. Williams Lee and others are, are certainly looking upstream, and it's, it's, it's worth revisiting if you haven't looked at it in a while. Uh, and the last point is to seek those providers with a pro proven track record. I would always ask for um, case studies. I would always ask for uh, references. Um, the, the company should be able to connect you with somebody who's being, who's effective either in your industry or with that horizontal process that you're looking to outsource. Um, because Realistically, as a marketer, you need to make sure that you have the brand control you need, um, and you want to make sure that that provider has a track record to show that they, they're successful with name brand companies in your space. So with that, I believe we're right at the end of our time. This presentation will be available on the Outsourcing Institute and will be um, emailed out to you afterwards. The link will be emailed out to you and, and all of anyone who signed up for the event. So. Thank you, Frank. Thank you to the Outsourcing Institute. Thank you to Williams Lee. Uh, and we look forward to the, the ensuing discussion. Thanks, everyone.